Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Lois Freed, and I am the moderator for our session today. We're very happy to have you all with us. I would also like to introduce the co-host that will be working with me, and that is Matt Baraka. Matt, you can give a wave out there. Uh, Matt will be with me today, and uh, we are very happy to uh, present our speaker who will be taking over in just a few moments. Without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our wonderful guest speaker for this session. Introducing Dr. Eric Mitra. Dr. Mitra is a nuclear medicine physician at Oregon Health and Science University in Portland, Oregon. He is an associate professor of radiology, chief of nuclear medicine, and program director of the Nuclear Medicine Residency. He earned his MD and PhD degrees at Stony Brook University in New York, followed by further training at Stanford University in California. His research interests are primarily focused on the clinical translation of novel radioisotopes for imaging and therapy. Please welcome Eric Mitra. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for that kind introduction and thanks to everyone who is uh, listening in. Um, I am going to be giving this talk on radioiodine uh, imaging and therapy for thyroid cancer. Let me go ahead and share my screen. I'm going to try to keep the Q&A box open. And if there are um, some straightforward questions, I, I might be able to address them as I go along. Otherwise, we'll try to get to them at the end. All right. So um, as mentioned, this talk is kind of a general overview of the use of radioactive iodine for thyroid cancer. Um, the outline is as follows. We'll go over some background topics to make sure we're all on the same page, and then we'll dive into the role for imaging first and then talk about therapy. And then if there is time left at the end, uh, we can talk about some, some more details regarding some controversial areas within this, which of, of which there are many. Uh, but if we don't have time for that, then uh, you know I think it's more important to leave time for uh, questions. Okay, so uh, when we're talking about um, the use of radioisotopes uh, and radiopharmaceuticals in this area, there's actually quite a number of things that are that are going on. And this is just a kind of a, a, a brief overview. There are many different radioisotopes, um, or, and, and another name for that is radionuclides. They're, they're synonymous of iodine that exists. There are actually over 30 of them that are um, present, out of which the top three that I've listed there are the main ones that are used um, medically these days. And they all have kind of slightly different uh, uh, purposes. So there's I-123, I-131, and I-124. And then the uh, overall radiopharmaceuticals that we use is uh, listed at the bottom there. So the iodine-124 that's listed for PET imaging is not a common thing that we use, so, so I haven't uh, listed that further. But uh, the more common ones that we use are I-123 in the form of sodium iodide, and that's what we primarily use for gamma imaging. And then also I-131, also in the form of sodium iodide, that's the primary one we use for therapy. And we also can do uh, gamma imaging with that as well. That's the kind of older version of doing gamma imaging. And then the other two radiopharmaceuticals that are also important are FDG, uh, which we use for PET scanning, and then dodatate, which is used for a specific type of um, pathology in thyroid cancer. That's also another form of PET scanning. So the focus of this talk is only going to be on the uh, iodine aspects of it. But uh, just so we're, again, kind of clear where everything falls in, there's many different types of thyroid cancer when we look at the overall different types of tissue and so forth. And the ones highlighted in yellow are the only ones that can be evaluated with uh, iodine. Uh, and then those other radiopharmaceuticals that I mentioned, that's where those other ones fall into those other types, such as for um, 
uh, medullary thyroid cancer, if, if anyone here has that, then that is where we would use dotatate PET scanning and then FDG PET scanning is basically used for everything else. However, most thyroid cancers are actually differentiated, over 90% of them. And so that's why iodine plays such an important role in thyroid cancer is because the vast majority of them do uh, have that particular pathology. Okay, a little bit more detail uh, about those two main isotopes that I mentioned that um, we primarily use in medicine, which is I-123 and I-131. I don't think you need to worry about uh, most of this unless someone has any specific questions of it, but I, I suppose it is useful to know that iodine-123 has a 13-hour half-life, whereas iodine-131 has a very long half-life of eight days, which is very useful for the therapy. They're produced in different ways. I-123 is uh, made in a cyclotron, whereas iodine-131 is made in a nuclear reactor. Um, for us and every other nuclear medicine facility around the country, we have it readily available from commercial radio pharmacies. That's where we get them. And they come in two different forms. The standard is a pill, which is shown on the top right there. And you can see that it's a very standard looking pill. It's not particularly large or unusual in any, in any way. And that's the one that we use 99.9% .9 of the time. It is also, both of these are also available as a liquid as well, which is shown on the bottom right. Uh, we use that very, very rarely, and we generally don't like to use it because uh, of the radiation risk from possible uh, spills. And also iodine itself is um, volatile. What that means is that it goes from a liquid to a gas. And so if it's uh, used improperly, then you then people uh, around uh, who are, are manipulating it, such as technologists, can, can actually inhale the iodine. Um, so it's the bottom line is liquid uh, is only used if the um, patient truly, truly can't, um, uh, can't swallow a pill. Otherwise, we always use a pill. OK, now let's move more into the clinical side of things. Um, once we, uh, now that we have that background in place. So this is an important slide whenever thinking about thyroid cancer in general. And uh, most people on, the, on this webinar are probably pretty familiar with it. And it's not uh, particularly um, striking um, in, in that certainly if you have more advanced disease, that's what the stage is referring to to, then you'll have a worse prognosis. And that's you know, very well known for all different types of cancers. But the two things that I want to highlight here, you can see that low stage disease, stage one and two, have a very, very good prognosis. So that's something very important to keep in mind and, and somewhat unique for thyroid cancer compared to other cancer types. So that's going to become important in our discussion. Um, and the other thing I want you to uh, make sure you see on this slide is that the bottom part is in years. So even the stage four patients who have a worse prognosis, it's still a very prolonged um, thing. So it's not something that we rush to necessarily treat. Uh, and this is very important for radioiodine and it's, and it's um, becoming more and more important, I think. And this is something that probably you're going to hear uh, throughout this conference and uh, from your endocrinology uh, uh, endocrinologists as well is that we are more and more very thoughtful about how we're using radioiodine, uh, especially on the image uh, therapy side, but also for imaging. Okay, so with that said, let's uh, see what is the role for radioiodine in uh, imaging. So specifically, there are three uh, roles for it. One is for the pre-therapy scan, where we're using a very low dose of either I-123 or I-131. Again, both of them have this gamma emission, which we can look at. However, um, the vast majority of people prefer I-123 because it, and then they reserve the I-131 for the therapy. Um, within this area itself, just the pre-therapy scan, we, there's three different um, potential uses for it uh, further. One is for your first therapy, and that one is the most debated one. Uh, a lot of people really favor it, and a lot of people think it's not really useful at all. In fact, two years ago at this conference, that was um, the, the entire topic of my talk was whether or not you needed to do this pre-therapy scan for your first therapy. Uh, we'll, and we'll look at an example of that. 
And then um, the other one is for every subsequent therapy, you definitely need to do a pre-therapy scan. That's not debated. And then in certain patients who have more extensive disease, we also use the pre-therapy scan to do dosimetry to calculate a specific dose uh, for the therapy. But that's only in very selective patients. The second major indication of doing radioiodine imaging is the post-therapy scan. This is done 100% of the time in all places. After you've received the therapy, you come back the following week, approximately five to seven days after you receive the therapy, and you get a whole body scan to see where that iodine went and if there are other areas where um, we weren't um, uh, aware that there was disease. So it's a very sensitive scan and it's, it's always done. And then, um, so for these three highlighted ones are the ones that uh, I mentioned and that we're, we'll look at some examples for. So the pre-therapy scan, the post-therapy scan, and then for select patients, the dosimetry scan. For all these scans, regardless of um, the indication or, or what's going on, you have to prepare in the same way. You have to stimulate the thyroid tissue. Uh, that's either using um, thyrogen, two shots given uh, one day apart, or you have to go through thyroid hormone withdrawal for two to four weeks, depending on which type of thyroid hormone that you're taking. And then the other thing you have to do is to deplete any normal non-radioactive thyroid, um, sorry, uh, radio, uh, non-radioactive iodine in your diet using a low iodine diet for somewhere between one to two weeks. So, um, you know, most people really hate that part and I can understand why it's, a, it's quite involved. Um, but that is very important to both stimulate the thyroid tissue and to deplete any non-radioactive thyroid uh, uh, iodine so that we can really have more sensitive imaging. Okay, so the purpose of uh, the imaging, the first one that I'll talk about is this pre-therapy one. There's the three different patients that we'll look at in more detail just at first glance. Even if you're not familiar with looking at these images, you can see these are um, three very different patients and most likely will have some differences in how uh, these patients are managed. And so we'll, we'll look at each one in a little bit more detail. So the, the first one uh, that is shown on the leftmost side is a 27-year-old woman. Every patient that comes to us for imaging in thyroid cancer or for therapy, number one thing is always to get a to total thyroidectomy done. We don't do any, anything until that's done. So you'll see that over and over again. So the uh, results of the pathology from that surgery of removing the thyroid is very, very important. And also something we really keep in mind when we're considering how to uh, do subsequent treatments. So in this case, the pathology showed a two centimeter tumor. And then we look for two additional details, whether there was lymph nodes that were involved or not, and whether there was any extension locally or not. And that local extension can be of two types. It can either come out of the thyroid itself, which is called direct extension, or it can uh, get into the, um, the vasculature, the, the blood vessels within the thyroid, and that's called um, uh, vascular invasion. So in this particular case, there was no local extension and then there were no lymph nodes involved as well. The other things um, to keep in mind are labs. The TSH is used to understand whether or not the patient has been properly stimulated. As I mentioned, it's important to do that prior to the scan. The TSH in that case goes up. Anything above 50 is considered uh, good stimulation. This patient you know, was in fact over 80. Anyone who gets thyrogen pretty much always has really good stimulation. So almost to the point that you don't even need to measure TSH because it's always so reliable. But if there's any doubt or if the patient went, went through withdrawal, then it's always important to check that. And then the other very important thing that you're probably familiar with is thyroglobulin. And so that's a tumor marker for thyroid cancer. And in this case, it was basically undetectable. So I can ask you to think about this for a second. You know, does looking at this scan really help matters? And what I can uh, guide you with further is that what you're seeing on this scan is iodine uptake within the body, of course. And for any radiopharmaceutical that we use in nuclear medicine, it always has some normal biodistribution, just to normal organs or to clearance. And then what we're looking, so we don't care about that, but we're, what we're looking for is anything beyond that. 
So in this particular case, everything that we're seeing is actually just normal. There's normal uptake in the salivary glands here in the head. There's normal uptake in the stomach. There's normal clearance in the bowel. And then there's, you can see a little bit of activity in the kidneys and the bladder because that's how it's cleared. So the bottom line is, in this particular case, it's a young patient who has a very small tumor that didn't go anywhere outside of the thyroid gland. The thyroglobulin also shows that it's undetectable and the scan shows that there's no residual disease within the neck or anywhere else within the body. So again, I ask, does this scan really help? And this is where I said, you know, for the first therapy, the scan can be kind of debatable because if you have all of these features on the left-hand side, most likely this patient doesn't need treatment at all. At most, if anything, we might've seen a little bit of thyroid tissue left over after the surgery. Even then, many people would dis, um, suggest that this patient doesn't need treatment. So that's why I say, you know, does this scan really help? Yeah, my answer to this would be, it's debatable. Um, the corollary answer to that, some people would say, well, it gives you even more confidence to say there's nothing left in the neck and therefore we shouldn't have to do any treatment. Here's the second patient that I showed. This was the middle one. Very similar uh, scan overall to the first patient that we just went over, but you can see that there are some areas of uptake in the neck. There's also some additional findings which are um, a little bit um, un unusual, I suppose, or, or unclear, and then they're highlighted here. So we have this neck uptake. We have some uptake here overlying the chest, which is probably just a normal breast tissue because uh, that also has sodium iodide importers, but we can't entirely exclude that there might be some disease within the lungs. And also there's this uh, focal area of uptake here in the pelvis, which is probably normal activity within the bowel, but for some reason it looks very focal there. But again, we can't be entirely sure. So let's look at the clinical history now. So this is a uh, also a young patient. Actually, this is a, a patient who was in our uh, clinic just yesterday. So um, they, it's an 18-year-old girl, again, total thyroidectomy, they have to have that. The tumor is a little bit larger than the prior patient. Also, there was local extension and some lymph nodes that were positive as well. Good stimulation. The thyroglobulin is low, but it's not undetectable. And so again, I ask for you to think, does this scan really help? You know, so in this case, I think it's a little, definitely a little bit more complicated than the first one, which was very clear, both, both based on the clinical history, as well as the scan that the patient really does not need treatment. Here, the clinical history is a little bit more ambiguous, and the scan is also ambiguous. <laughs> so, um, well, this is a good example of why these scans can be kind of difficult to interpret and uh, use. So what, this is a good... Uh, case to show, we can also do some additional imaging, which you might be fam familiar with, which is called SPEC-CT. That's where we basically uh, do three-dimensional imaging uh, to kind of further evaluate those things. So this is the same patient showing the uptake in the neck. So this is a focal area of uptake in the right thyroid bed. It's one of those two hotspots that we saw in the neck. The chest portion of the scan shows that that uptake we saw overlying the chest is in fact normal breast tissue. It's also useful to double check that there's nothing behind that, uh, such as pulmonary nodules that might represent metastasis there. So that's also normal. And then here in the abdomen, as we suspected, that focal uptake is just in the bowel. And so that's normal. So this is oftentimes done and very helpful to kind of give, give more confidence to what we're seeing on the planar imaging. But we'll go back to this uh, to uh, this case, and again, I don't know whether this scan ultimately really helped or not. More or less, it's in line with the clinical history. We expected some, you know, residual thyroid tissue left over after surgery. It doesn't look like from the scan that these are uh, lymph nodes. So I suppose I suppose that part is helpful because if there were lymph nodes, then you would definitely want to treat. If there aren't, then if you probably don't need to treat. Being a young patient, I, sh I showed again those uh, survival gr graphs and it, uh, overall the patient is in a very uh, good prognostic group. 
So again, I, I think my answer to this is that it's uh, debatable and even the need for the therapy in this case is debatable. Some people would uh, argue that it's good to uh, ablate this residual tissue and make the thyroglobulin undetectable and then that makes it easier to follow. Other people would say it's not gonna have any change in outcome. And so it's really not needed and why give this additional uh, radiation when it's not needed. Okay, and then the last case um, here is the kind of opposite end of end of the picture. This is a patient who obviously just from these images, uh, again, if you're not familiar with reading them, it's, it's clear that this is very extensive uh, metastases. And so this is a 57 year old woman, uh, of course, had the thyroidectomy and the pathology showed a very large tumor. There was extension locally. There was, were multiple lymph nodes that were present. The uh, stimulation is good again, and the thyroglobin is very high, which is corresponding to these uh, extensive metastases that are seen here. These metastases were also seen on CT. So you might uh, think based on this clinical history that I've shown that kind of like the first two cases that this scan again is not really helping. But I mentioned in the beginning that for all subsequent therapies, you have to have a uh, pre-therapy scan. And the reason for that, that is because in more advanced patients like this, the uh, disease sometimes no longer takes up iodine. And you wouldn't know if it did, does or did not take up iodine until you do the scan. So in this particular case, the scan absolutely is needed. And in this case shows that all of this disease is still very iodine avid. And so we can go ahead and and do the treatment. So that's the specific indication for doing it in subsequent cases. Okay, um, I mentioned another reason to do pre-therapy imaging in a select group of patients is for uh, patient-specific dosimetry. So let me talk about that briefly. Uh, the, here, the, the goals of doing the dosimetry is basically to prevent toxicity to uh, bone marrow or if you have extensive disease within the lungs, to, then to the lungs, because you don't wanna to try to treat the disease but then cause uh, too much toxicity, which would then be harmful. And so the, the way we do this is we uh, consider what's the highest dose that we could give, which would result in a retention two days later of either 120 millicuries in the whole body or 80 millicuries if there are a lot of disease in the lungs. So those are our limits. And anything that we can give uh, exceeding that is ideal because um, that's then going to be more effective for, for that extensive disease, but we don't want to exceed those limits. You can also do uh, specific organ or lesion dosimetry to calculate how much a specific lesion is going to get. That's useful for patients who have uh, not very extensive disease, but perhaps a very large uh, area of metastasis, which you're trying to treat. So let me show you an example of that. This is a patient who is an ex example of uh, someone who had just a, one very large metastasis to the pelvis. And then there was also some residual tissue here you can see in the neck. Everything else that you're seeing on the scan is normal. So this is how we do this dosimetry. It is unfortunately a little bit uh, involved. For the, for the patient, you have to come back. You can see uh, multiple time points to get uh, multiple scans done. It's just one dose of low dose of iodine 131 that you take, but then you come back for all these scans. And what you can see over these scans is that things are changing over time, right? The normal uptake in the stomach and in the bowel is slowly decreasing over time. And then the uptake in the neck is increasing over time. And also this uptake in the pelvis. And I know it's a little bit hard to see on these images, but you can slowly see it's getting stronger over time as well. So in this particular case, we did both the overall uh, limit that I talked about, but also we did a specific lesion dosimetry to this specific pelvic lesion to see how much radiation were we able to deliver. And again, you try to maximize both those things. So this then leads us to the post-therapy scan. And this is the exact same patient that I just showed. And so we did do, the, did do the dosimetry. We did calculate the maximum uh, activity that we could give. And then we give the, uh, they ask the patient to come back five days later. And you can see what a difference there is between the pre-therapy imaging and the post-therapy imaging. 
Uh, so uh, again, as a reminder, this on the left is using a very low dose, whereas on the right, we're using a very high dose for the therapy. And that's what why we see such a big difference and why I mentioned that the post-therapy scan is always, always done because it's such a sensitive scan. So we still see that uptake in the neck, but now we see a very high uptake in that uh, pelvic metastasis. And that's good, good news, right? Because then we're delivering all that radiation to that area, which is then, then treating that. And I, and I also mentioned that the other reason for doing it is because it's such a sensitive scan, it gives us a good opportunity to make sure there aren't any other areas that we weren't aware of. And in fact, you can see on the scan that there are no other areas. So those two areas that we already knew about are indeed the only areas that um, of disease. Here's another example of a post-therapy scan, but I'm starting with the pre-therapy imaging. And, um, now you might be a little bit familiar with looking at these images. Again, we are seeing normal uptake in the neck, uh, normal uptake in the stomach and bowel and clearance into the bladder. Beyond that, uh, and I show this to um, some, of, some of our residents too when I'm teaching them about, uh, about this. And you know, most people will say this is a negative scan. You don't really see much. If you're very nitpicking, you know, you might kind of like uh, one of the cases I showed before say, well, there might be a little bit of very mild uptake in the chest, but again, that's probably just normal. So yeah, most people would call this normal. But then when we look at the post-therapy scan, you can see that it's quite a bit different and particularly in the lungs. You can see there's very diffuse uptake in, in both lungs. So this is what um, a diffuse metastasis to the, the lungs looks like on a post-therapy scan. And again, why we always do it, because we didn't know about that on the pre-therapy imaging, but we now know about that on the post-therapy scan, and, then, and this will then affect um, the subsequent care for this patient. Now, I, I did mention repeatedly that this, this pre-therapy scans are questionable whether or not to, to do them. So how about if we hadn't done that and we just had this? And again, you can kind of see even in this example that the pre-therapy was kind of debatable because we still have that same information from the post-therapy scan, which we do 100% of the time. And so what did it really you know, change? The pre-therapy scan didn't even show it, so we wouldn't have known to um, you know, adjust our dose based on, on that. So again, this is just kind of hopefully kind of giving you some picture into you know, the, how we use these different types of imaging. I equally don't want you to be too concerned that, wow, you might be missing so much on a pre-therapy scan. What we didn't, uh, didn't show you uh, previously was all the clinical history. And again, keep in mind, we always look at everything together. We don't just look at a scan blindly like that. So in this particular case, again, this is a 65-year-old post-thyroidectomy, uh, moderate-sized tumor, but there was local extension and there were lymph nodes that were positive. And the biggest clue was that the thyroid globulin was definitely elevated. So when we look, when we put together this clinical information with this scan, actually the, the discordance, it doesn't make sense. Why would the thyroid globulin be so high, but the scan basically looks normal and it tells us that we're potentially missing something. And this is also these uh, where uh, other types of imaging definitely have a role. Because if you don't see something on the pre-therapy scan, then perhaps you should consider doing an ultrasound of the neck to see perhaps if there are lymph nodes there or a CT scan of the chest to see if there are pulmonary metastasis uh, there. So we, again, this is uh, you know, focused on radio iodine imaging, but I want you to you know, definitely understand that we always look at you know, everything, everything together. So most likely, we would have already done a chest CT and we would have seen those uh, lymph no, um, pulmon pulmonary nodules and we would have treated accordingly based on that. Okay, so taking about half the time for imaging, now we'll um, focus on the therapy, which um, can potentially go a, a little bit faster because you have a lot of the, the background in place now. Okay. Similar to the imaging part, there are very specific uh, reasons why we uh, do the treatment. So let's look at that. The three main reasons, or, or sorry, let me start with the three main goals. And I've already referred to this um, just in terms of the imaging. Number one, 
in terms of treatment is always to do a total thyroidectomy. Number two, that's where we come in with the radioiodine therapy. Uh, it's often abbreviated RAIT for radioiodine therapy. Um, and then we're using only, only now the iodine-131 um, because that's the only, only type of um, proper radiation emission. The I-123 can only be used for imaging. And then after the radioiodine therapy is done, then the next very important part of the treatment is thyroid hormone replacement. Of course, that's needed because um, after thyroidectomy, you have to have some way of getting thyroid hormone, but also it's critically important to kind of suppress whatever residual thyroid tissue is left over after all of the initial therapy, which you might think there should be nothing. And that in many cases is the case after you've surgically removed the thyroid and also um, killed off anything that's left over with radioiodine, there really shouldn't be anything left. But, you know, of course, there, there can be um, some small cells left. And that's the, the real purpose. The secondary purpose of the thyroid hormone is to keep everything suppressed. And in terms of follow-up, um, uh, again, the thyroglobulin, which we've looked at a few times already, is the key tumor marker to say whether or not there has been a recurrence of the disease. As long as that stays undetectable or, or low, then it, things are in good shape. If they, it slowly starts rising, then you would need to start thinking about what things you can do to try to identify where that is, either by ultrasound, or a CT, or perhaps redoing a radioiodine scan. Um, and then if you do find where that disease is, then you can either go back and do surgery to remove that. You can redo the I-131 therapies up to a maximum of um, uh, approximately five times, as long as it remains radioiodine avid. Or if it becomes non-radioiodine avid, then you would have to change to chemotherapy. So that's the kind of overall goals for treatment and follow-up. So specific goals for radioiodine therapy, there's again three of them. The first one is to ablate residual thyroid tissue, that's the word that we use, um, and facilitate surveillance, meaning again make that thyroid globulin undetectable so that even small rises in the thyroid globulin are measurable. So that's called ablation. When you don't think that there's any residual thyroid cancer, but you just want to get rid of whatever normal thyroid tissue is left over and make it easier to follow. The second term that we use is called adjuvant therapy. The specific definition there uh, is that, again, you think that you've removed most everything, but you might be worried for some reason to, for having very a small amount of disease, maybe microscopic disease left over after the surgery. This is where you know the local extension or local lymph nodes come into place because you might you know have some concern that there's perhaps a little bit of leftover cancer. That's called adjuvant therapy. And then the third one, sorry, it's showing up this way. The third one is to actually treat known or suspected uh, cancer either locally or uh, throughout the body. So known would be, of course, again, based on imaging and, and so forth, you know that there is actual disease. Suspected would be where the thyroid globulin is very high, but you're not necessarily seeing something on imaging, and, but you're still wanting to treat that. So those are the three uh, goals, ablation, adjuvant therapy, or actual treatment. So let's see how we select those um, specific doses for radioiodine. Uh, and we'll look back again at these same um, patient examples that I showed previously to help kind of guide this portion of the talk. So, and I will uh, say right off the bat that these are just very general guidelines. They vary a lot based on different institutions, based on different practitioners and so forth. So, so definitely take these with a grain of salt. You, you will need to have a um, good discussion with your, with your specific treating physician to decide you know, why they speak, picked a specific dose for you. But uh, number one would be, again, this leftmost patient would be a dose of zero, meaning no treatment at, at all. And that's, again, completely reasonable for many patients. But um, if you are planning to just ablate residual thyroid tissue, so that might be the se second example potentially where you think you've re actually removed all the cancer, but you see a little bit of residual tissue, maybe the thyroglobulin is slightly elevated and you just wanna 
get rid of that. That's when you would use a very low dose, and that is typically in the range of 30 to 50 millicuries. Um, the next one would be adjuvant therapy. And uh, again, we can use this middle one as an example. Say because of the um, inv in local invasion and the fact that the patient did have some lymph nodes that were positive, maybe you're concerned that there might be some residual thyroid cancer left. If you're doing adjuvant therapy, then the dose is definitely higher and you would start at a minimum of 50 millicuries and potentially go up to 100 millicuries. In fact, a lot of people just use an empiric dose of 100 millicuries pretty much for everyone, especially those groups that are not doing pre-therapy imaging so that you wouldn't even necessarily know whether it looks like patient one or patient two. In those cases, uh, people just give a standard dose of 100 millicuries, and that's also completely reasonable. And then now we're getting into treatment. If you thought that there was definitely disease left, say one of these on, on our SPECT scan was uh, clearly a lymph node or we had seen something in the lung, um, now you're you know, really doing treatment, then the minimum dose you would want to give is seven, 75 millicuries all the way up to 150 millicuries, depending on the extent of the disease. Um, and then if you're treating distant disease, such as the patient on the right, or say this um, thing in the pelvis on the second patient did or turn out to be real, then you would start with a minimum of 150 millicuries, go up to 200 millicuries. And for a patient on, such as the one on the right, again, you're trying to really maximize the dose that you can give, but at the same time, not cause toxicity because they have um, so much disease. And that's where you would actually need to do that pre-therapy dosimetry and ideally try to be able to go even higher than 200 millicuries. So that gives you kind of um, an idea of the spectrum going anywhere from 30 millicuries to more than 200 millicuries uh, based on the amount of disease that's left, based on what you know from surgery, based on the thyroglobulin, and potentially based on dosimetry. So all these factors kind of give us some approximation. But as I said in the beginning, there's going to be a lot of local uh, variances in how um, physicians choose. And I think it's a good idea for the nuclear medicine physician to also talk with the endocrinologist or, or the surgeon, whoever is your primary physician, um, because you know all that information is very important kind of coming up with a dose. Um, the, the middle patient actually to provide a little bit uh, additional history, we ended up actually not treating this patient um, because again, they're low risk but also because the patient has a, had a history of leukemia, which was previously treated with chemotherapy. And in such a patient, you, don't, you are particularly conscious of not giving uh, uh, radiation to cause toxicity for fear of second um, malignancies. And so um, you know, that's a great example of where you need to really kind of work together with the um, primary physician. Uh, all your physicians should work together to come up with the final treatment plan. It's nothing is done in isolation. Okay, some uh, comments about side effects of radioiodine. The um, most common ones that we see, they're very transient. They, they uh, last for a few days and typically go away is mild to moderate nausea. You might also have some swelling of the salivary glands. You might be tired for a few days and there might be a um, temporary change in taste. We don't worry about these because they are typically pretty well tolerated and um, will again go away within a few days. So while it's not pleasant, it's nothing to really worry about. A little bit more worrisome than that, but these are now more uncommon, is that the salivary gland swelling, um, sometimes also the nasal lacrimal duct uh, can have some radiation damage and, and then cause some obstruction. This can be also um, temporary, but, but a longer period of time. In very rare cases, it can, it can become permanent. And then the change in taste can also very rarely become more long-term. There does appear to be a dose relationship to, the, to these. So the higher the dose that you give, as you, as you might expect, the more incidence of uh, these uh, more long-term side effects that you can see. But according to the literature, it's a very wide range. So I have a very hard time counseling patients myself because you know, I don't know whether to, whether it's going to be a 5% chance or a closer to a 50% chance. This is one reason why we definitely try to, you know, keep the radiation uh, dose as low as reasonably achievable. 
given all the constraints that we talk about in terms of the disease and the pathology and so forth. Most worrisome, but this, these are luckily very, very rare, would be that the radiation that we give you to treat the thyroid cancer then subsequently causes a subsequent cancer. Of course, very worrisome, but um, nowadays with the um, thoughtful dosing that we give, generally speaking, we don't typically see this. In fact, it's so rare that you can't really identify it in specific patients. You, you have to do very large uh, cohort studies in large groups of patients, and even then you see very small incidences of cancer, and it's very hard at that point to even know, even to track it down to the radioiodine, because if you follow any large group of patients um, over time, a percentage of them will develop cancer. So it's hard to know whether it's really attributed to this or not. In the past, when they gave very high doses of radioiodine for treatment, this is, I'm talking about like in the 1940s and 50s, uh, there were more incidences seen, and typically there were leukemias, uh, small intestinal cancers, bladder cancers, and breast cancers. Uh, but again, nowadays we don't typically see them. So I don't uh, you know, worry about it as much. And then the last category is serious, but avoidable ones. And this is uh, things like radiation damage to the lungs or bone marrow toxicity in patients who have a lot of disease there. But again, this can be readily avoided by doing appropriate pre-therapy dosimetry. I will say that not all institutions do dosimetry uh, because as I said, it's a little bit involved. So if that's of concern, then you know you should talk, talk to that uh, your physician about that. And um, you can you know, choose potentially to go to a larger academic center where they uh, maybe do that more readily. Okay, um, this is just a um, brief slide on this risk of secondary uh, malignancies, just to show you that there has been a lot of studies that have been done over time. The table on the right uh, is one of the larger and more recent studies that I found. And it's interesting uh, that for this, it shows what it's showing is that as you're increasing the dose here for solid cancers, as well as for leukemias, which is a blood cancer, that it doesn't really change the um, statistics of how often you actually see this. What that's, I think, telling me again is that the relationship between um, this is very, very loose and, and not really direct. Uh, and again, the way I counsel patients is to say that, you know, you have a cancer now and that's what we're trying to treat and not this, you know, almost theoretical risk of a, of a second cancer that may or may not happen. Okay, um, so we have a little bit of time left. Maybe I can ask the moderators, do you want to switch to questions? I see that there's quite a number of questions there, or would you like me to continue talking about some more details? Well, Dr. Mitri, you might want to take a few of the questions. Uh, we can certainly start there. Sure. Would you like for me to read them or would you like to read the questions out? Yeah, I'm happy to uh, read them. I don't know if you uh, had identified any particular ones that you think would be most beneficial for me to answer. I can do that, but otherwise I can just go down the list. Yes, why don't we just go down the list for now? Okay, sounds good. So the first question that was asked before I even started was that um, both the low dose radioiodine scan and the FTT PET scan have come up negative, but the lymph nodes were confirmed with ultrasound and then fine needle aspiration. Should I get the high dose radioiodine treatment in the hopes of treating uh, that, um, which were not absorbing when the low dose was administered or uh, will when there will be when the high dose therapy is that's a great question, right? So this is the the category where, which I alluded to where the thyroglobulin is probably elevated and in and in this particular case the disease actually is even confirmed by biopsy, but you don't see it on the iodine scan and right. So there's two possibilities there. One is that it's not taking up the iodine, and so if you give the treatment, it's not really going to have any effect because it's just going to get washed out of the system and not get absorbed there. Or maybe the second possibility is that you just they're too potentially too small to see, um, and I and I even give that example that I showed of the pelvic metastasis, the large one that we did the dosimetry on, and you, we barely saw it on the pre-therapy scan, even though it's very large. And then on the post-therapy scan, it was very very uh, evident. So 
this is um, actually, you know, leads to one of the topics that I had for this detailed considerations section, which is that um, it's it's a great question, and it and I don't think you 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 could go wrong either way. Again, it kind of depends on the overall picture and whatever else is going on. I, I think it would totally be uh, reasonable to give um, what we call an empiric dose, where we're not seeing the disease on the radioiodine scan, but we give a dose of therapy just to see what happens on the post-therapy scan and whether there's a, a drop in um, thyroglobulin. Roughly speaking, a rule of thumb is that approximately 50% of patients will respond that way. And then the other 50% of patients, it turns out it it's not going to take the radioiodine up, but in that case, at least you know that after you do the therapy, and then you then you know definitively for the future. So, really good question. It's a complex topic, um, but either way is a reasonable strategy. Okay, another question is: some PDTC can have uptake. Not entirely sure what PDTC is. Does anyone know? A poorly differentiated. Ah, thank you. Yeah, um, poorly differentiated typically does not, but yes, there's always some overlap uh, between th those things. But if the pathology is poorly differentiated, generally speaking, radioiodine doesn't have a role. Um, are patients with high SUV values on FDG PET, would you consider radioactive iodine treatment? Yeah, that's another good question um, and kind of relates back to the, the one I just answered. So. If it is poorly differentiated, that's when we would do FDG PET scans rather than radioiodine. Again, there is overlap uh, between those. So for this particular question, I would say it really matters what the iodine scan is showing, not what the FDG PET scan is showing because, because of that overlap. So if the iodine scan is also showing a uh, high uptake in those same areas, I think it's worthwhile to, to do the treatment regardless of the fact that the FDG PET uh, is also showing high uptake. But if there's a, a, a large amount of discordance, and certainly if the radioiodine scan is not showing much uptake in those areas, um, then it doesn't uh, make sense to do the treatment. Um, for patients with more rare and aggressive histologies, such as insular thyroid cancer, do you consider RAI? Again, I think it's the same, the same philosophy, which is that uh, as long as it's taking up Radioiodine, I think it's at least worth doing one treatment to see what the response there is and what the post-therapy scan looks like in those cases. Uh, it's generally not the first thing that we would go for, but if, if you know, other options are, are not good for um, other reasons, it's, I think, worthwhile always to at least try doing a radioiodine scan and, and seeing what the uptake is. Are certain metastatic sites, such as liver metastasis, not good candidates for R RAI? I think uh, the answer to that is that depending on the distribution of metastasis, um, and liver is a good example as being a very rare area uh, of metastasis to begin with, um, the more metastasis you have, the worse the prognosis is, and therefore, you know, the effect of the radioiodine is probably going down. But I wouldn't considered a, a direct correlation. If you do have high uptake in those liver metastases, again, I think it's uh, worthwhile attempting the radioiodine if other options are, are not so good. Um, but it is true that as the degree of metastasis goes up and the um, distribution is to more unusual areas, most likely the, the uh, effect will be less just because the overall prognosis, prognosis is not so good. What are your thoughts on the scan initial therapy where a thyroglobulin antibodies are produced? Um, so I think this when I you know talked about kind of in detail, we look at the scan in conjunction with the thyroglobulin um, and and the and together with that the thyroglobulin antibodies as well. The bottom line there is if the thyroglobulin antibodies are present, then we essentially don't focus on the thyroglobulin it, itself as much, but we basically look at the um, antibodies in the scan in a similar way. So if the antibodies are high and the scan is positive, then that leads us to do the treatment. If the antibodies are high but the scan is negative, then you uh, potentially might not want to do the treatment. 
So we use it essentially in the same way, uh, just focusing less on the thyroglobulin itself. Do you do pre-therapy uh, scan in patients with intact thyroids? Not for thyroid cancer. Uh, we do do radioiodine scans for also for patients with hyperthyroidism. Uh, that's a completely different topic for, for this same you know, radiopharmaceutical. Uh, but for thyroid cancer, no, we never do it unless the thyroid has been removed. Uh, because one of the reasons for that, just so everyone is on the same page is in that case, the intact thyroid would just take up all of the iodine and would leave very little to look for metastasis and other areas of disease, which is, you know, again, kind of the whole point of doing the whole body scan. When you're considering whether to scan patients uh, like number one or two, are you also considering mutations in their cancers? If so, are there certain uh, mutations or biomarkers that would um, make treatment more necessary. Um, I think this is an evolving area, certain um, mutations such as BRCA um, and so forth, and other ones that are evolving. Certainly, you know, again, it's more of a pro prognostic issue. Um, and so in, in terms of kind of overall consideration for the patient, it, it would be important in the specific time that, you know, we're considering that treatment. I think it's a little bit less important uh, as opposed to, you know, the factors that we talked about in terms of what the actual scan looks like and what the thyroid globulin is and what the uh, pathology showed. But certainly if you're, uh, if, if it's one, of, especially patient two, if there are, um, you know, if it's, if it's a debate, uh, debatable, then we would, you know, try to take in as much information as we can. And if the prognosis is, is worse, then, you know, you, you would kind of be pushed more towards doing the treatment, I think. Could pre-therapy, Scans help determine the dose used for treatment later on. Um, the pre therapy scan is only used to determine the dose for that specific time. And I didn't get too much into the logistics of it, but you know, again, because of the stimulation that's needed, either with thyrogen or thyroid hormone withdrawal, both the pre therapy scan and the therapy are all done essentially together within the same couple of days or at least within the same week. Um, so in the future, if we were thinking about doing the treatment um, and trying to decide a dose, et cetera, we would have to redo the pre-therapy scan. But since you have to undergo the stimulation and the uh, low iodine diet in any case for the treatment, it's relatively low bar to do the pre-treatment scan at that point. This, that point that I just made is an important one for why, again, it's... Um, debated whether or not to even do the pre-therapy scan, but a lot of institutions choose to do it because of what I just said is that, you know, you have to do all of the hard work for the treatment anyway. So why not just do a low dose scan and see what you see and maybe it'll help and maybe it won't, but you know, it's not that much of a additional burden. Uh, what did you mean when, what did you mean that using the iodine wouldn't change the prognosis with uh, patient number two? Who decides if you need radioactive iodine, the endocrinologist, surgeon, or the new medicine? And I heard that iodine can cause other types of cancer like leukemia. So I think I covered the, the uh, topic, uh, this question, um, especially the uh, consideration of second uh, malignancies, which again are very, very rare. And to answer the first part of the question, um, it should really be done, as I said, in conjunction with with everyone, and that's how we we always do it. Whoever this is the primary physician and uh, and uh, myself, we always always have a discussion about it, and also even about the dose. You know, even if we are deciding um, to to go forward with the treatment, you know, it's good that everyone is on the same page about these things. It shouldn't be done in isolation. Am I right in saying all de-differentiated thyroid cancers are radioiodine re -re resistant, but all uh, REI resistant carcinomas are not necessarily de differentiated. Yes, that's correct. That's a compli complicated question, but yeah, I think it was, it's correct. We do have just a few more minutes. Okay, perfect. I think we're, I think we're getting through. Um, let's see, I took the normal thyrogen dose. Dosing pattern of two injections. To, okay, I think that was just a statement. Uh, for low risk papillary patients, RA scans or treatments are not automatically done. I didn't have either 
is this considered best practice? Okay, so this, uh, again, I think I uh, alluded to that, and as actually one of the other topics for the, for the discussion that I wanted to have, so I'm glad it was brought up, that, um, yeah, for low risk disease, so that means localized disease, typically in younger patients, that's the kind of prototype for that. Um, less and less, I think, radioiodine is being done. I did want to mention along that note that the latest guidelines for the treatment uh, for radioiodine from the American Thyroid Association are a little bit old at this point. They're still 2015 guidelines. We, we don't have any newer ones. But the practice uh, during that time, and I would say kind of over the last 10 years, has slowly been moving more and more away from doing radioiodine for low risk. So I think what what you had done was, uh, you know, a, a, a totally appropriate. I wanted to mention this one, is there a maximum lifetime amount of radioiodine that can be used? Um, what I've always learned is 1,000 millicuries. I mentioned that the maximum we typically use without dose, dosimetry is about 200. So that would mean five uh, cycles of treatment that way. Usually, you know, it's very hard for people to even get to five cycles because uh, you know at some point during during that course of many many years the disease becomes no longer radioiodine avid anyways. But if it remains so, then typically one thousand millicuries is the main one. Are there any for fertility issues after RAI? Uh, important question. We um, recommend not getting pregnant for one year, ideally minimum of six months. And both partners uh, should use some form of contraception to prevent it. So double contraception, uh, because it's so important that uh, there should not be. But after that period of time passes, then there typically is no fertility, long-term fertility issues that you need to worry about. Okay, um, yeah, there were more questions, but I think for the sake of time, maybe we should stop. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Mitra, for just a, a wonderful presentation uh, and very informative and thorough in covering the uh, radioactive iodine therapy. We really appreciate you taking your time to be with us today. And for the questions that we couldn't get answered, hopefully uh, in other sessions throughout the weekend, you may be able to ask your question again uh, and, and get answers. So please jot down your questions and keep track of them if we were not able to answer them today. I wanna thank Matt for being my co-host and helping out and assisting so very much much. And uh, everyone enjoy the rest of the conference. We're just getting kicked off and uh, take a break and on to your next workshop. Again, thank you, Dr. Mitra, and have a good rest of your day. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.